hello welcome back to the channel really good to see you again today and I have a special treat for you today yep we're going to be chatting with two very special photographers good friends of mine all the way from Arizona in the United States of America Mike and Chris Perea and they've got lots of great images I want to show you and also just to hear a little bit about their story so without any further ado let's get into it all right well welcome guys I'm really pleased to have you two on board here today uh, Mike and Chris Perea all the way from Arizona in the United States and uh, it's a bit of a multicultural thing today we got Mike and Chris there uh, Arizona we got Switzerland we've got Australian we've got a bit of everything happening but it's fantastic so anyway thanks guys for coming along and we're going to have a chat and talk about these guys and their photography which is absolutely awesome now Mike I, I've been following your channel for well probably since you started now Mike and Chris if you don't know have a YouTube channel and I think it's called uh, Perea photography now is that is that your you, you've had a few uh, name changes along the way I think but uh, anyway so if you haven't seen this channel I'll put the um, links down there but have a good look because they've got some fantastic work now the first thing I want to ask you guys is um, and I know you've just addressed this on your channel but how did you get together how did you meet and, and what's the backstory behind Mike and Chris. Thanks, Thanks for, for having, having us, Richard, Richard. Um, first, first of all. And yeah, yeah it's actually, actually quite funny. funny. I joined a photography workshop with Thomas Heaton and Brandon Vanson in Patagonia a few years ago. And I think Mike saw me in one of the videos, the YouTube videos that Thomas Heaton put out, or Brandon, I don't even remember. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he started talking to me on Instagram and he was asking about the workshop, like asking about the workshop. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And then uh, I decided to go back like the following year and do the same workshop with the both of them. And Mike was asking me, you know, how was it? Did you enjoy it? So we started talking and uh, somehow I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, 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 well, I'm glad you did. Yeah, so, well, you know, we, we were talking and, and decided she was going to come out here to Arizona just to come visit. And uh, we started off just being like, a, hey, I'll take you out for sunrise or sunset somewhere, you know what I mean? Sunrise right before sunset. So I keep saying we because I have a special guest here. And we have the super talented Chris Fugley. Hi, guys. You know? And we are uh, actually just starting an epic road trip. We're going to head up to Moab, Utah, back through northern Arizona. It ended up being a 10-day road trip. <laughs> uh, we went to New Mexico, up to Utah, and then back down. So we, we did like a big 10-day road trip. And, uh, you know, we didn't kill each other. After 10 days of being on the road trip together, we actually uh, enjoyed our, our time together. So we ended up making plans to go uh, the next month or a month and a half later we went to scotland or we met in scotland so she was still living obviously in switzerland so we met in scotland and then we went back to switzerland for uh, about a week after that and every month we would meet somewhere else we'd meet in italy we met in iceland then we went to patagonia for the workshop uh, but by the time the workshop came we had already planned on her moving here we were gonna get married and, <laughs> and everything so actually we'll be married here two years uh, next week Oh, congratulations. Well, that, that's amazing. And and I love that story. And I know I've, I've actually heard that before, but I wanted our listeners who probably may not have heard that before to just get a bit of a glimpse into that because uh, I think it's fantastic because both of you are in your own right. Um, I think excellent photographers and, and really good storytellers. And you know, Mike, it's interesting before this little thing, I, I went back and looked at some of your earlier stuff on your channel and you know you even right back at the beginning you probably cringe when you look back because we all do oh, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but besides that it's it's the the ability for you to actually communicate with people I think is really really good and I love that and and since Chris has come on board it, it, she's so different to you in, in the <laughs> style but it, it just complements so well and I know I've said this to you guys before, but I really do think it does. And it's a unique combination. Not many people around the world operate as, as such a good pair of photographers. Let's go back a little bit further for both of you. How, how did you guys actually get into photography? So I was always interested in art and painting. Even as a kid, I was going through like boxes and boxes of crayons. 
And uh, when I was a teenager, I just grabbed my, my mom's camera. We would go to like Italy or Spain for summer vacation. And I would just like steal her camera and, and take all the photos of the trip. And I had the best time. And like getting older, um, there were people in just like my family or friends, they were getting like, they're having birthday parties or, you know, later they would get engaged and then they would getting married and they would ask me if I could take their photos. So it started out from like taking just vacation photos, uh, soon became like weddings and newborns. Um, and I don't know, you probably know how that is. You do like one wedding and then it's like a rolling system. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Exactly. I know. <laughs> and people that you you uh, photograph the wedding a year later or two, you will photograph their newborn. So yeah, I was a wedding photographer for for a few uh, years, and uh, and the landscape didn't really, you know, wasn't really in the picture. Um, but then I'm always like trying to educate myself and progress in my photography. So I attended a a landscape photography, photography workshop and it was so interesting and I learned so much about like color and just daytime like when you have to be out for the good lights and all of that um, and I never looked back and it's, it's awesome I still do weddings here and there or like people photography but I prefer yeah. landscape or nature photography now yeah I, I totally relate to that because I've done a lot of that stuff myself portraiture and weddings and um and things, but I always saw that for me personally as a job, whereas doing uh, stuff that's outdoor uh, now, and as you know, in my in my case, it's mainly at night time. <laughs> for me, even though it is my job, I don't see it as a job anymore. It's like, wow, I just love this yeah. as hard as it can be. So, what about you, Mike? Would you tell us about your backstory. So, I think uh, like our styles, my story is completely the opposite. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I I didn't have any interest in art or photography growing up. I was always like a, a very technical math person. Um, I played sports when I was younger, so I had just zero interest in photography whatsoever. But what I did have a, a big passion for and I always have was the outdoors and travel. Mm -hmm. So that's why I just, I, I concentrated that. Um, pretty much my entire life was, was about that, being in the outdoors, hiking, fishing, all that kind of stuff, camping. And then uh, I just decided on a whim, to be honest, there wasn't any any real reason or I just I was one of those people who thought if I bought a camera I could take better photos you know that's that's yeah yeah what yeah. I thought so I, I ordered a my Nikon D3300 and uh, when it was on its way in being shipped I went on YouTube and I found a couple of people and I just became absolutely obsessed and was just from then on 100 like just zero to 100 when it came to photography and became <laughs> obsessed which was unexpected because I you know, growing up, I had zero, zero interest in art or anything like that. And I was, yeah. I always considered myself one of the, the least artistic people, I, you know, <laughs> ever. Uh, <laughs> because I just, I couldn't draw, I couldn't paint, I didn't know what I was doing. But, you know, I, I definitely think that uh, I found my creative uh, avenue with, with photography for sure. I think you're, you're, you're a guy, in some ways, a little bit like myself. Um, you have a go at stuff. And uh, I, I can see that you're willing to try new things out. And, and as I said, I look back at your earlier stuff and I can see that's what you were doing. You, you're trying all sorts of different things, uh, trying different camera gear, trying whatever. And we've all done that. We all have to do that. Some people, though, who are wired a little bit more on the creative side, hate that stuff. They don't want to try anything. They just want to use something to get a job done, the creative job, whatever that may be. So would you say that the, the two of you now working together, um, it's a good combination, isn't it? Like the two of you are coming from different angles of the creative scale. You tell me, Chris, if this is the case for you, that, that Mike's technical understanding and, and just the way he's wired technically probably helps you with a lot of the other stuff. Is, is that right? I think so, yes. And I think especially like the wide open scenes and just like the, the area that we live here and, yeah, uh, yeah. and Mike showing me how he's working with that landscape, just like my style developed just because of that. I had, a, I, had a, I had a very hard time at the beginning, you know, with just like somebody coming from forests and lakes yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the Alps <laughs> <laughs> thrown into um, a desert landscape. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was hard. Yeah. It was hard to find something pho to photograph at the beginning. And it took me probably about a year to even like see things. But like Mike has definitely influenced me with this. And uh, 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can see that. Well, all right. Well, speaking of images, let's let's have a look at some there. Now, um, you've got quite a few images there that you want to. Um, well, I want to have a look at, and and I have been looking at. So, um, you've dabbled a little bit in uh, nightscape photography and Milky Way photography, um, which of course is my interest. There's a few there. I really particularly love Mike. This time lapse you sent me through of the uh, rooftop tent. It's it's fantastic. It's just a, a beautiful Milky Way core rising above the landscape, and mm-hmm. and you've got the, the the truck. Is it your your Toyota? Is that right? Yeah, got yeah. The out there with the rooftop tent. Yep. Yeah. Tell us a bit about this trip. So this is in uh, the western part of Arizona. It's about a three hour drive from where we're at, and uh, all around us, it's hard to tell from there, but all around us is a a big field of cholla cactus. So this is that jumping cholla, that teddy, teddy bear, bear cactus, cactus that. that uh, is in a, a lot of the Sonoran Desert here in Arizona. So we went out here and uh, just spent the night, wanted to, to come out and shoot the Milky Way. Uh, we're pretty fortunate here in the Southwest US where we can see a lot of the Milky Way. Very dark skies out here compared to places like New York on the, on the East Coast. Uh, you don't get a lot of these same types of skies for the most part. Over here on the West side of the US, uh, things are a lot more open. So we're, we're, we're very, very fortunate, fortunate to have, to have these, these and, and, and uh, these, these dark, dark skies. skies and, and, and I have really gotten into uh, time-lapsing Milky Ways. I don't know what it is about that, but I just, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with it. Yeah, well, uh, I love that too. Um, I guess time-lapse is one of those things that it takes a lot of commitment, as you know, time, obviously. I'm yeah, looking at another one as we're speaking, which is the hoodoos. Ah, uh, the hoodoos, yes. That's a day to night one, so that's that's good. I like that one. Yeah, the, and that uh, adds a, a little bit more of a dynamic with the day to night. I think is pretty cool, but it, it does require even more time. You know, sometimes Milky Way time lapses, you can set it up and go to sleep and let it just run all night. <laughs> but the yeah. day to night, you have to be there babysitting that camera and changing the settings with each one and and stuff. But yeah, I, I just uh, one of those areas that well, actually we did that same area on a workshop here recently, and uh, it's such a such a cool spot. So tell us a little bit about your workshops. You've been running workshops for, for a while now. Just give me a bit of a rundown on how you do those and perhaps where and who, who's welcome to come. Yeah, anybody's welcome to come. Uh, we run astro-specific workshops and we run uh, general landscape workshops as well. Uh, we do them all on Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Utah, and uh, parts of California as well. And uh, I find that the astro workshops are the most fun and the, the the biggest learning experience, I think, I think people really have a, a genuine interest in land, in uh, astrophotography, photographing the stars. And I think it's the one of those things that the mo- most people have a, a hard time uh, getting into as far as you know the settings. And it's a very technical uh, area of landscape photography for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it is. And it's it's I talk about this all the time, where you've got to always be mixing that technical side with the creative side. And they yeah. don't always want to mix. Nope. And, and uh, what it comes down to is that people's brains shut off because you're either wired one way or the other predominantly. And sometimes you just don't want to go there. You don't want to read the manual or you don't want to read the the instruction sheet, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so um, what about you, Chris? It, 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 you've done a little bit with Mike, I suppose, with, with the Nightscape Astro stuff. Is it something that you've had an interest in or are you just sort of tagging along with that at the moment? I'm more tagging along with that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I actually took the first night photo on that trip that on that road trip that Mike said earlier, mm-hmm. that 10 day road trip. Yep. And I yep. included it in the photos that I sent over. So this is my first nightscape photo and I was just amazed, you know, how how it worked out. Like I'm sure you remember the first time that you took a photo <laughs> of the night sky and it was just like mind blown, right? <laughs> what you can see, what what the camera can pick up. Yeah, yeah, this was yeah. the one. This was the one that was taken on our very first road trip when we came out here. When she came out to Arizona, we did this this road trip. We went to White Sands uh, National Park, and yep. uh, yeah, yeah, this is our very first one. Yeah, good stuff. No, that's fantastic. I, I do, I do like it, and I, I do like the fact that I mean, I, I know your channel is predominantly daytime landscape photography, and we'll get into that in a minute. But I, um, I just like the connection, I, and I like to know where people are coming from, and. Mike, what you mentioned before about your 
it's it, the the astro of the night stuff is something that sort of is in your gut a little bit and it's not for everybody not everyone can handle the, the late nights for a start or the, the <laughs> lack of sleep or anything else just now i'm going to show we're going to show a heap more images in a minute but just tell me a little bit about the gear that you guys use and i know it's a little bit of a brand war going on here between you two and I know some of this is on your channel already, but for those who haven't seen your channel, I'm just interested in how you came to the choose the equipment that you use to shoot with. So I started off with Nikon and I just stuck with it. I, I've always loved the way, you know, the menus are set up and everything. So all my gear is all Nikon. I've just recently switched to uh, the mirrorless system. All you know, I sold off the D850 and all my F-mount lenses. I now have the Z7 II and then the original Z6 or Z6 <laughs> for your yeah, yeah, Australian yeah. audience. Um, yep, yep. And then all the, the F mount or the, uh, the S line lenses. I got the 20 millimeter 1.8, which is my go to for Astro. It's, I mean, you know, yeah, it's an absolutely yeah. amazing lens. Yeah, yeah, it is. And then I have the, the, the trifecta, the 14 to 30 F4, 24 to 70 F4, and then the 70 to 200 F2.8. So yep, I am all yep. Nikon. Yeah, what and Chris, I know you're you're from the other side of the 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 bridge, uh, the Canon stuff. Yes, exactly. Uh, basically, same as Mike. I started out with Canon, and I just stuck with it. And uh, I recently switched over to the mirrorless system as well. So I have the R5 for almost a year now, I would say. And yeah. I'm really happy with it. I like it a lot. And I only have three three lenses. So the 15 to 35 uh 4.0 and then the 24 to 70 2.8 and then the 70 to 200 4.0 i uh, i know that that canon r5 is a very capable camera i've actually used one myself but anyway that's good so let's have a look at some pictures so do you have a favorite image out of the ones you've sent me through um and i'll put that up on the screen and, and just i just want to hear the backstory and and how you came to and why you like this particular image for my favorite photo, I want to use the blue, uh, the Patagonia tree with the uh, mountains in the background there. Okay, so tell us about this image. So yeah, this one is uh, one of the few images that I, no matter how much time has passed, I look back and I just think this is one of my absolute favorite images. And I'm that's saying a lot for me because I'm pretty fickle with my images. I, I fall out of love with them pretty quickly. So this one has definitely stood the test of time. So we were down, this is uh, the Patagonia workshop that we attended together. And uh, this particular morning was a true, true Patagonia morning where uh, it snowed, it was howling sideways wind, rain, and uh, these mountains were covered up for pretty much most of the morning. And, uh, you know, we're trying to, to find compositions and things to shoot, but these mountains the are completely, completely covered, covered up, up, so it was a total guess. guess. Uh, of where, where these, these mountains, mountains would be. I mean, I, I generally knew where they were going to be. It was a challenge. And then, you know, once these mountains just broke, I mean, it was the reason why I named this revelation was because the clouds broke in front of the mountains just, just for broke. a few minutes. And I was able to, to scramble around and find a, a composition quickly and, and, and uh, end up getting this. And it just one of those images that sticks with me with the entire experience of the morning, uh, the workshop in general, being in one of these places that's just absolutely mind-blowing to, to, to experience. Okay, Chris, what about you? What's your favorite image? So I think this is my favorite just from recently that, that I took. So this is here from Phoenix, actually. It's just probably like 20 minutes from our house. And this is special to me because I feel I finally figured out how to photograph the desert and, <laughs> and, show, <laughs> and show how you can work with the clear skies because that's basically like 80% is, is clear skies, which is awesome for nighttime photography, but for landscape yep, photography yep. can be a little bit boring. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And here in this photo where you can see the, the pink flowers, uh, these are the desert ironwood trees and they're very special to this area. They only grow in um, a very small area in the country and Every year in May, they bloom, and it's just like an explosion of pink and purple. Um, and to time that right is, you know, can be a little bit tricky. And I feel like we were going out all year, like summer, fall, winter, to get the right compositions and find all of these trees that were ready in spring, when, mm -hmm. when finally that one week when they bloom, um, that we're ready. And I feel like um, we timed it right, and it worked out great. And I think that's why this photo is special to me. Yeah, it's awesome. I love it. 
And and I can instantly see the diff- the way that you two see things differently. Uh, and that's why I mentioned earlier that I think you complement each other so well, um, with, especially on the channel, on the YouTube channel, because everything, as you know, YouTube's fast paced. You have to put everything quickly in, into a, you know, 10 or 15 minute video. Yep. So that's, that's excellent. So on that same theme then, um, the type of photography or the, 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 the form of photography that you like the most, Mike, you were talking about your lava image. So for me, the, the, the type, type of photography I like is anything where you have extreme conditions, whether that's the weather, whether it's, you know, like a monsoon storm or something, or it's extremely cold in the snow, or also like this here, uh, a volcano was erupting in 2018 on the island of Hawaii. And I was able to, one, take a helicopter ride over the top. And then this uh, image here is from uh, a boat. So, so we, we were, were in, in a boat right outside where the lava was flowing into the ocean. And uh, you could feel the war- the water was warm right here. Like it would splash up on the boat every once in a while and you'd get this like kind of hot water uh, from the ocean that's hitting your face and you can smell all the sulfur. So uh, these kind of things where, where all of your senses are engaged and you're just uh, having to overcome some obstacles to, to just to get a photo, you know, whether it's like I said, the weather and rain and snow or it's volcano <laughs> lava trying to figure out how to shoot these things it's uh for me that type of photography is uh is stuff that i i, I remember for the rest of my life like i'd never forget stuff like this and and how i felt during the shot awesome yeah that's a fantastic image i, I i've never seen anything like that this it looks scary <laughs> it's terrifying <laughs> <laughs> all right so what about you chris do you, do you out, of, out of your images what, what do you have a particular style of landscape or whatever, any, anything that you could say that is your, your, your style or your form? I think it's more the smaller scenes in nature that attract my attention. So either patterns or color. Um, and on the other hand, I really like trees. So I think I, I'm, I tried the last few years to come up with an array of pictures that includes either like, you know, trees or small scenes or um, like this one here, just like almost more attention to the flowers than to the gigantic mountain yes, there in the background. Yes. Well, I, I like this image. It's, I, as soon as I saw this one, I thought, man, that's, I like that. It's different. And I, I really like how you found those flowers. It looks like there's nothing else in that landscape except that one bunch of flowers. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, this this was um, this was a pain. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was almost as much work as uh, you know combining um, nightscape photos. <laughs> it's probably like oh, so it's probably, focus stacked, focus stacked, obviously. Obviously. yes, it's probably twelve photos focus stacked because it was so windy. This is a very windy mm. area. Yeah, and yep. you know the flowers were moving, and <laughs> it was a pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, so so that that leads me to another question. Um, you mentioned the pain of focus stacking and the pain of of relating that back to astro and nightscape photography. It, is that how how you think a lot of people perceive nightscape photography? It's too hard, or it's too difficult. It takes too long to actually get a photo. Yeah, I would say that that's that's probably the case with a lot of people. I think that. There's a, there's a lot of challenges when you're just starting out in landscape photography. And first of all, you're, it's at night, you know, it's dark outside and depending on where you live, you know, you have the, the, all the predators out and, and you can't see what's spiders, where you're going, spiders, snakes, snakes and, <laughs> you know, the, the mountain lions and things like that, bears, whatever, wherever you're at. And so I think, think that, that's a challenge in itself. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> And so it's just, you know, you have that challenge and then you, you're trying to, to mess with your camera in the dark and figure out settings. And, you know, one of the things that I've, I've noticed, I'm sure you've noticed the same thing. When you have somebody who's never done astral before, their biggest uh, challenge is focusing in the dark, you know, getting that sharp photo. So you really have to know your camera. Uh, and so there's, there's that on top of, you know, like I said, a, a lot of other things. But uh, I think that's... For me, what I've seen, that's probably the biggest challenges for, for nightscapes is... Yeah, I think the expectations are extremely high when, you're, when you see all these images and then mm. finally you're like, okay, this, this is the night, I'm going out, the, the weather is good, I'm like, yeah. the yeah. Weekend, I have the weekend off, and then you're out there, you're taking photos and you come back, I don't know, three in the morning, 
And then the next day you want to work on the photos and then nothing looks good, you know? And it was all this work that you did, but you didn't get anything. And I think that's, you know, can be very frustrating at the beginning when yeah. you first start out. And it can be frustrating further down the track as well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Instagram and places like that have a lot to answer for because uh, there's a lot of images out there that are very highly manipulated that cannot possibly be taken in a simple uh, one or even two or three shot uh, sitting, and yet people expect they're going to get something better than what they do. But on the other hand, what I find the key is to have a dark sky, which is what you have there as well, uh, because if you have a dark sky, at least then you've got the stars are nice and bright and shiny. You haven't got light pollution everywhere killing the whole sky, and and then you're trying to do something with a foreground. But, yeah, it's challenging, isn't it? But uh Anyway, look, I've got another picture here, uh, Chris. It's one of yours, and I like it. And it, maybe it fits in a similar theme to what you were talking about, just picking something out of the landscape, which is the smaller uh, subject. Tell us about this one. That's actually, the story is quite interesting. So this is in an area, as you can see, there is like a big drop off to, to a canyon. And Mike, we were there together, and Mike was shooting to the left here, and there was that big gigantic like river and sunrise and beautiful sky <laughs> and i was just shooting a tree because <laughs> i was just like very drawn to this tree and, and the, the way, way you know in uh, in the background the sun first hit the canyon walls and how the tree would just like fit in there perfectly and uh you know maybe like pointing out the few z lines that you see in there the z lines yes <laughs> yes going yes, through yes. I, I'm, I'm very drawn to that well, that's excellent. And I look at an image like this and I think there's a creative brain working on this um, because sometimes we can walk past this. I, I talk about this sort of stuff all the time. We walk past simple compositions all the time looking for something that's uh, more obvious and yet there it is staring us in the face, but you have to have eyes to see it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think I think it's excellent. So, uh, Thank you. No, it's, uh, I mean that. It's great. And that's that's one of the things that's drawn me to your channel is that, that both of you do this, but just the, the way that you're able to pick out something in the landscape um, that's that's somewhat different to, um, well, he, here's another one. Hang on. Let me just, um, what about this one? Yeah. So this one is great. This one, we were in Talisker Bay in Scotland and we were at this place for probably a good hour. It was really overcast and rainy and uh you know the, the waves are coming in and crashing over these rocks and i was sitting there and i was getting frustrated i couldn't figure out you know how to shoot this place and uh, i was struggling and i'm you know just trying to frame something up with the cliffs and there's a waterfall on the side and and there's some sea stacks out there and i look over at chris and she's just looking down at her feet and looking down and just watching for like maybe five minutes and i kind of walk over and i'm like what are you looking at and she's like i just kind of like the way this is moving around you got a little bit of sediment in there and and the way the waves come around this rock here i like that and i was like okay and i just kind of walked <laughs> off and it was doing a thing and then she shows me this and i just like man she is good <laughs> <laughs> so would you say that uh, um sorry mike on that topic would you say and both of you um are you, do you sort of study how the other person does things and then say I'm, I, you learn something from each other in, in the way that you approach the scene? Yes, yes, absolutely. One of the things that I've always, when I first started and for a long time, and I still do occasionally, but I try and look at the, the big landscape and using pieces, putting them together like a puzzle and having a nice foreground and you got nice conditions. And Chris will take one of those pieces and use that as her subject, you know, and, and just narrow down and, and leave everything else out. And a lot of times what, what you're doing is when you're, it's more about what you're leaving out of the photo rather than what you're in, including, you know, mm -hmm. and, and removing any kind of context from a photo and just showing one little small vignette of the entire landscape, yeah. I think can yeah. be more powerful in a lot of ways. And I've, I've learned a lot from stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's the same for me. And especially, especially like, like, I don't know if it's like technical or gear related, but for example, I wasn't using my long lens like almost never because I, I always felt like it's so boring because it's what you see with your eyes, you know, it's like, you know, enjoy a beautiful view. So I wouldn't really work with it. But then Mike showed me so many different ways that you can use the wide angle lens, just like pointing it down at a rock and then have that um, immediate foreground so much, you know, 
so much attention to that immediate foreground, which can mm. be super mm. interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I yeah. think this is something that I really learned from Mike, like how to use the, the wide angle lens in, in the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I, and that's, that's what it's all about. It's about learning something different each time you go out and trying to find some way of improving yourself. Now, I'm just looking at this image. Mike. Is that is that that same volcano? Yeah, so this is actually from a helicopter the day before. Uh, but yeah, the same volcano, same area. Uh, this is shooting straight down with a telephoto lens. And as we were making a circle around the, the shore, I looked down and then the clouds, it, or, you know, this is actually, uh, it's a lot of them. So, so it's when the uh, lava, lava hits, hits the water, water it creates, creates all this steam and, and these... Uh, pyro clouds anyway so they, they create all this steam and right in the middle of the steam it kind of opened up and you see this lava beneath it so it's kind of framing itself and it it looked pretty cool so i just happened to get a couple of shots of this yeah it is it's very cool so uh, talk to me about um what, what is it that motivates you to get up out of bed you do a lot of sunrises uh, you guys <laughs> anyone who follows your channel and by the way i want to plug your channel because um, I'm sure a lot of the people who follow my channel may not be necessarily following yours, and I think you should. Um, so I'll put some links and etc. there. But uh, you guys get up, uh, uh, you have a lot of breakfasts. I know that, and you, <laughs> you're like me. I think, Multiple breakfasts. Yeah, 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 you're like me. I'm always eating on my channel, and I and I think to myself, do I always eat that much? And I probably don't. It's just that it seems to always feature in my. And it seems to with you guys. And I think you guys have also got a sweet tooth. Am I right? You like a bit of a snack every now and then? Yep. I'm sweet. <laughs> we're we we're like, we hold the world record for eating chocolate. So. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, now I've lost my train of thought. I was talking about something. Um, just, uh, we just, motivation. Uh, yeah. What, what's the motivation? Caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> no, just, you know what? Uh, it's it can be hard. I mean, most people do not like getting up in the dark and, and driving maybe an hour or two to catch a sunrise. But what I've learned is that no, how, no matter how hard it is, I never regret it. I never regret going out for a sunrise ever. When I'm out there, even if I don't get a photo, just the fact that you're out there in, in, in nature at, at sunrise, for me, it's always worth it. I can yeah. sleep later. I can take a nap or something. But, you know, a little bit of caffeine and, and we're good to go. <laughs> yeah yeah but but i mean it's practically it means you've got to you've got to plan yes for for a very early start or, or maybe a late finish whatever it may be yeah it's, it's not easy is it no no it's definitely not not easy at all i yeah i think it's also we're both people that like we're awake early mm -hmm. like in general mm -hmm. yep. but yep. like after 10 you know yeah we're yes. like <laughs> good night <laughs> Okay. Okay. Maybe it's also it's also that I don't know. I, I don't have like a secret sauce for you know. Yeah, we we naturally we're, we're both early early risers and we go to bed pretty early as well. So that that does help. Uh, do you find an energizing of watching the sunrise? Do you, do you see that as something that that lifts your spirits a little bit? Yes, absolutely. I think just you know you're seeing the start of the day. It's the beginning of something. That's always exciting, right? The beginning of anything is always exciting. So that's. For me, the sunrise is always brings that feeling of just it's the start of the, the day, you know, and it's when I wake up and I see that it's already daylight out, I feel like I've missed part of the day already, you know, so I like okay. being up okay. for sunrise. Yeah, I, you know, I can relate to it, but it rarely happens for me uh, because I spend so much time out at nighttime. I can't possibly be up at the crack of dawn <laughs> every day, uh, but I do relate to it. I'm, in, in Many times when I've been out on my trips and I'm, sleeping in the car or something i often see the early part of the morning then and and i love it just moving on a little bit uh mike this this is an image that you've um sent to me which is a pano T tell us about this one yeah so this is one of my more involved photos i think this one it was like a total of about 60 photos i was really experimenting with uh wanting to get this composition for for a few months and uh, you know, did some pre-planning beforehand to see where the Milky Way was going to line up with this particular rock. And I had this idea in my head with the uh, you know sticking a little loom cube into this this cave or this little alcove of this big rock here. And then uh, it was a matter of just firing off shots. And I think there were, each shot was like six or eight photos uh, focus stacked. So I mean, not focus stacked, uh, stacked for noise reduction. Oh, yeah. So oh, I yeah. took uh, like six or eight photos. Uh, six wide and, and eight photos each for for just the sky and then I took you know some long exposures for the foreground and then an exposure for just the light 
uh, in the middle there too. So it was um, probably more more in depth than it needed to be, but it was uh, it turned out great. I, mean, I printed this photo several times for, for some clients, so uh, it turned out actually really good. And, and the uh, amount of air glow there was actually pretty neat as well. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, where is the location? This, this is, is in, in southern, southern Utah, Utah, a place, place called Escalani. Escalani. Yeah. Now, a lot of my subscribers would recognize a lot of these places because I have a, a lot of people from the US subscribing, so they, they would know it better than I do. Let's move on to this one. This is a Joshua tree. I, I love this picture. It's so simple in its uh, composition, and yet it's it's a very powerful image. Yeah, for, for me, the most powerful images are the ones that stick out in my mind, whether it's my own or somebody else's, are the ones that are simple like this, just a really strong subject and, and, and the Milky Way, you know, and, and lining it up in a way that helps the, the subject of the tree. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the Milky Ways with like, you know, all the big mountain ranges and the big landscapes. I like just very simple, a tree or a cactus or just one subject and the Milky Way, just that's the focus because I think like a lot of people when you use wide angle lenses for any type of photography it's very easy to lose a subject when you're trying to include uh, making it over complicated but these types of photos here I think uh, are, are some of my favorite just because it's very simple and it's uh, it makes more of a statement I think yeah so was there just on this one uh was there any moonlight or is that just ambient light in the foreground uh, that's a, a bit of ambient light. This is a, uh, an exposure blend. So what I did was I took one photo for the, uh, the landscape and then, you know, I stacked, uh, some, uh, several photos. So actually this is probably about five photos total, um, four for the folk uh, for the noise reduction, you know, and then yep. uh, one yep. long exposure for the foreground. This is actually taken during a workshop. And, uh, we know one of our challenges we talk about is finding, you know, locations in the dark. So I actually had to mark this during the day. Because yep, it was yep. probably a good 10, 15 minute walk out into the, the middle of this, this Joshua Tree forest. So, uh, you know, we, luckily we found it again in the dark. Yeah, well, you're right. That is a big challenge, finding things in the dark. There's another one I was going to show. I think I showed this earlier, Chris, by mistake, but I'll, I'll get it up now so you can have a look at it. And this is one of yours. Okay, tell us about this one. So... Here we try and tried and experimented with different lights. So this one is, I think, three different lights that we pointed at these rocks. And I just, you know, this was just after, I think, the, the uh, Game of Thrones finale with the dragons and everything. Yeah, and so yeah. this photo just reminded me so much of dragon eggs. And, uh, and I just, I personally, when photographing nightscapes, I really like to integrate uh, the, the artificial lights to you know, like show more of the foreground just because I'm drawn so much to that foreground. Yeah. But I think it, it worked out great. We also had, you know, this was also during um, a workshop and we had fun with like light writing, just like writing love or whatever, <laughs> like hearts. Yes, yes, <laughs> and yes, we had yes. so much fun. It, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome, awesome what you can do at night. Yeah, I find that some of these astro workshops, and I'm sure you've experienced this, where people get really tired and kind of silly and we start just kind of making all kinds of weird jokes and everybody's kind of just laughing and doing weird stuff and that, that's that's one of the fun things about astro is everybody's so tired that we just find the funniest things to, to do yeah you're right silly is a good word <laughs> speaking of speaking of uh, uh light painting with with text I, when i was doing weddings at the end of my wedding time if you like People were wanting me to do their wedding because of my night photography, and we'd go outside at night time uh, at the reception or whatever and do night stuff. And and uh, I, I learned how to write love backwards with a torch or a flashlight. Uh, it took a while to learn because I had to do it backwards, and it's not easy as you, as anyone who's tried would know. Uh, for me, my, my all of my lighting that I do is based on my older techniques that I learned doing portraiture, and and I've done a lot of theatre and and. Um, performance and events and things like that as well and and you just learn after a while about light and in the landscape it's quite interesting because uh when you're when you're shooting landscapes obviously you're not doing anything with the light because it's all dependent on the light that's natural that's already there uh so the difference for me is that the the um, nightscapes where you can add some light you're actually in total control of the lighting unless there's moonlight or whatever. Uh, and I find that quite challenging and at the same time quite, if you can embrace it, quite liberating. I've got a lot of images here. I'm just going to scroll through them uh, because mm -hmm. we're going to run out of time. And I, I don't need you to necessarily 
describe every every single image, but I, I just want to show them um, just for some variety. You've got some for, a bit of a forest scene here. Um, if anything stands out, just let me know. So this one here, I like photos like this, this, this last one you just showed. Um, again, this is about kind of removing context. You know, you'd think you're in this, in this rainforest or, or some, but we're actually standing on a, on a little offshoot of a highway, just shooting this here in California. And that's one thing I, I love about this that Chris took is, you know, this place looks like it's some exotic place, but it's really right off the, right off the highway <laughs> in a major, major area, you know, so. Yeah, I, I love this one with the, the cloud in the background, the low-lying cloud, um, almost like backlighting this tree. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just beautiful. It's something I, I also love mountains. I think my, my, my grandfather was Italian. So uh, I think Tati, that's where that name comes from. And um, I've never been to Italy, but where they were from, just you might be interested in this, Chris, um, the Swiss-Italian border. That was the area where the family came from. Oh, wow. So um, there were obviously a lot of mountains around. Beautiful area. So we're, we're basically family, right? <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, we'll claim that anyway. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going through some images here, quite atmospheric. And I can see what, what, this one, Chris, what, what's the story here? So this was in, this is in a place called White Sands in New Mexico. And um, it's not a very large area, but if you point your camera in the right direction, it looks endless. And it yep. is um, yep. gypsum. So it, you know, it's not gypsum sand. How do mm -hmm. you say that? Yeah, gypsum, yep. yep. So it's, yep. it's not hot. You can, you know, walk around barefoot. Me personally, I love the natural light and the reflection and shadow. So I'm drawn to scenes like this that are um, not super, not a lot of contrast and not too intense in color. And here's another one with just the, the single tree stark in the landscape. Beautiful. Oh, and I think I remember a video about this. Would that, would that be right? You did did a video yeah. featuring this rock. Yes, yeah. and that was one one of the moments that I used Mike's trick with just like pointing the wide angle lens down and you know getting that crack yeah. In, yeah. in the landscape. And it makes it look like almost like a valley, but it was like tiny in, in yeah. the landscape. Yeah. Yes, it's quite interesting what you're talking about there. Using the the uh, the lens distortion to create mm -hmm. drama in the image. Yeah, I think it's important knowing uh, some of the characteristics of your lens and being able to use that for, you know, making some maybe something that seems pretty small and insignificant. You can make it um, very exciting and very powerful in your photo by using that that perspective distortion. Oh, and, and this is just lovely. Um, this, is our, the, this, is our, this is the Arizona gem here, one of the one of the seven wonders of the world. The Grand Canyon. Oh, well, I was going to say Grand Canyon, but uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, it, 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 there's so many places over there that look so magnificent like this. Yeah, yeah. I, I was very tempted to only photograph that, that tree there on the right-hand side. <laughs> 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 but I decided, you know, can't do it. The conditions are too good. <laughs> well, you know, you, you don't have to worry about saving film. You can take both. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this, is, this looks like that same tree that Mike took earlier. It, it's close by. It's it's about. It's just me a short walk away. It's a, a big area here that has a lot of these types of trees in them. Yeah, beautiful. That is dramatic. I love the low angle that you've got on this one. I was so low on the ground. I I couldn't even get lower with my <clears throat> excuse me with my tripod. And I I used I channeled my inner Thomas Heaton with this one. <laughs> uh, he he. I will, I will like spill his biggest secret here, but. <laughs> He uh, taught, taught me, me how, how to, to arrange, arrange the, the trees, trees in the, the landscape, landscape and, and that, that it is like, like the, the most, most important, important thing is that the the ends of the branches don't touch anything. Yep. Yep. And yep. here, like lining up these three different trees, I, you know, I had to go so low that that one tree in the middle wouldn't touch that, you know, rock area right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. No, and I just no, steal his trick every time. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. Works every time. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's, a, that's a great tip. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, another tree. So obviously, Chris, you like trees. <laughs> yeah. I do, yes. Yeah, so do I. I it, you'll notice in my images, I take an awful lot of trees. Um, <laughs> because I just find them to be fascinating. I really, really do. And uh, what have we got here? This is 
Mike? Mike. This is this is my version of the tree. So actually, Tom was sitting next to me when I took this one and used that same concept of just creating that separation between the tree and the mountain and making sure that all the branches didn't cross any of the, the plane of the, the edges of that mountain there. So making sure that, that right at the very top you have that little uh, almost like a cup it's cupping the mountain there and not crossing and as one of those things he taught us was you know making sure you 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 have that separation to show yeah. a little bit of depth in your image in effect what you're doing is looking at the fine details of the image yes absolutely yeah, this one I, here i'm sure we've all played that game where we look at the clouds and one person sees like a pirate ship and another person so will see like a dragon and for me i like doing that with landscapes too you know you, you look at this and i see a like a cobra. That's what I see. I see the tail and then the head sticking up and you know, a little guy playing a flute or something and the cobra's <laughs> dancing. I, I picture stuff like, like that, that when I when I look at these types of photos and sometimes it isn't about, you know, composition or light or for me it just it it reminded me of something else and I wanted to highlight that. So I, I took this photo. Yeah, awesome. All right. Now that's really, really good. So so I guess we'll we'll get close to finishing this up. Uh, it's fantastic talking to you. I always enjoy talking to you guys you, you energize me a little bit you give me you give me, <laughs> awesome. you, you give me, you give me some, no no i mean that you give me you give me some uh a level of uh yeah oh, i i can see what you're doing with your images and i know i know when you run a youtube channel there's a lot of pressure there's a lot of things going around in your mind thinking am i getting across what i really want to say here right um so i want to encourage you because i think you do quite well both of you and, and the fact that you're coming from two different angles really, uh, for me anyway, I can see exactly what you're doing and I relate to both of you in, in slightly different ways and it's really good. Um, but I want, to, I want you to give me your advice or our, our viewers here, advice on, on how to, what you think you could do to improve or what they could do, what we could all do to improve our photography. I think for me it is getting out of your comfort zone and do something that is completely different than what you're used to. And for me personally, I told this story earlier with, you know, just attending a landscape workshop, even though I was photographing weddings and it just like brings you a completely different um, view to like everything and just like never stop, always look forward and try something new. Yeah, mine would be uh, just experiment. You know, there's, there's a lot of rules with photography that you'll hear online. Uh, with you know rules of thirds and rules of you know this or that or the golden ratio and, and all these things and, and that's all well and good but i think you, you really got to experience and take chances uh, experiment and take chances there's a lot of social media pressure with with taking these epic landscapes that everybody else is shooting but i highly recommend just getting out and and maybe not watching so much youtube you know get get what you can out of the the you know these three tips and five mistakes and all and all these things that people <laughs> That people talk about, you know, which they, they have their place, but I think you really need to get out and use your own, use your own voice uh, to, to tell your story, not somebody else's words, you know, and this really involves uh, getting to know your landscape and really diving deeper, deeper than, than just, just, you know, sitting up on a viewpoint and taking a photo, you know, go a little bit deeper and experiment and, and just take some chances. Awesome. Fantastic advice. All right. Well, um, you've been very inspirational today. Love going through the images and I've appreciated chatting with you. I'll put all the links uh, on the video all over the place so people can follow your work and your website and all the other things. And uh, yeah, thanks heaps for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Yes, we appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Richard.